All right, if you want to get your Bibles out and go to the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, that's where we're going to be uh, this morning as we continue through the prophecy of Jeremiah. And to catch you up to speed, at this point in the book of Jeremiah, the nation of Judah has been put under the yoke of Babylon by God. So because of their disobedience, God allowed Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar to, in 605 B.C., foray into the country, uh, deport many Jews to Babylon, including uh, princes like Daniel, the prophet. And then in 597 B.C., there was a second attack on Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, where he took many others captive, including Ezekiel. And so what we have today in chapter 29 is a letter that Jeremiah actually writes to the captives that have been in Babylon, and we find ourselves between the second attack in 597 B.C. and the third attack that happened 11 years later when Jerusalem was finally destroyed as well as the temple. Now, the context is that Jeremiah is saying that the Babylonians will rule over, the captivity will last in Judah 70 years. They'll be taken to Babylon. But competing prophets are saying, not true. Jeremiah is liar, liar, pants on fire. It's only going to be two years. In fact, it's going to be over here in just a bit. So now Jeremiah writes this letter to set things uh, straight, if you will. And so in verse 1 of chapter 29, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem as it were, to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, And all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And this happened after Jeconiah the king and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. So after the second deportation in 597 B.C. And the letter was sent by or carried by the hand of Alasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sent to Babylon, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, and now to the captives, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what they're supposed to do. Build houses and dwell in them, Plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. He goes on to say in verse 7, Seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, notice this, you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you have dreamed because they have lied to you as essentially that you have been caused to dream by them. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name, and I have not sent them, says the Lord." Now, uh, for the Judeans, Babylon was not their home. They had been deported there. They had been taken there by force. And we get a glimpse into how badly they hated the captivity when you read uh, Psalm 137. I have just a snippet for you up there on the screen, but I also have a famous painting of Psalm 137 rendered uh, many years ago. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 4 in Psalm 137 where the captives say, 
By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. That's Jerusalem. And we hung our harps upon the willow trees in the midst of it. For there were those who carried us away captive. They asked us of a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Hey, sing us one of those songs of Zion. They said, Hey, captives, sing us one of those Jewish songs. And they replied, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How are we going to be able to worship here, Lord? How are we able to do it here? We don't want to be here. We've been deported by force. How in the world are we supposed to worship you, Lord, without a, without a temple, without Mount Zion, without everything that we know to be holy and true that reminds us of you? And yet the Lord's telling them here in these verses that they were not just to survive captivity, that they were supposed to thrive and they were supposed to make the land of their exile a better place. You say, well, how? You know, you might ask yourself in that position, how do I thrive when I hate it here? <laughs> how do I thrive when I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a foreigner in this land? I, I don't enjoy it here. I don't want to be here. I don't like it here. And so here's what God tells them. He tells them they're supposed to build houses to dwell in. Apparently some of them had just been surviving They've been like, I'm not going to put any investment in this place because God's certainly going to deliver me just around the corner. So I'm just going to subsist until I can get out of here stink town. And so God says, no, I want you to build houses and I want you to dwell in them. I want you to plant gardens and eat their fruit. Now, if you know the Eastern mind in an agrarian society, this would have been completely appalling to them because when you plant trees or fruit, uh, if you plant anything in the ground, you're claiming that this is your home. This is your homestead. So they're saying, what, God? You want us to plant not only gardens, but then stick around to eat of their fruit? God says, yes, furthermore, I want you to raise a family. And by the way, I want your children to raise families because you're going to be here long enough that you're going to see your grandchildren in Babylon. And then he says in verse 7, for them to seek for the peace of and pray for the peace of the city in which they live. Because interestingly enough, in its peace, you shall have peace. He says, stop praying that God's going to send you back in two years to what you knew. Invest in where you are and pray for the peace of the city where you live and in it you'll have peace. Now, this is a truth that the Lord is trying to impress upon the reader of the Bible throughout Scripture. And that is that you can be in something, a place, a job, a school, and you can not be of it. In fact, uh, when you think about the 17th chapter of John, I have a snippet of this section I'm going to read up there for you. But in John 17, you have Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane directly before he's going to the cross. So this is where he defeats, if you will, Satan. It's where his flesh and his humanity makes the final decision to submit to the torture that he knows he's going to endure. And so he's sweating great drops of blood and he prays this in the garden of Gethsemane in the 17th chapter starting in verse 14 for those who the Lord gave him he says I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not of this world he goes on to say I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one they are not of the world. Here he says it again, just as I am not of the world. And then he goes ahead and says, sanctify them or set them apart, mature them in Christ by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. So Jesus was one who more than anyone else proved that you can love something 
without liking it. You can love something without truly identifying with it. And this is the whole of Christianity. Paul said, I become all things to all men to win a few. Now, we are prone to uh, love only that which we like. (laughs) I'm prone to love that only which I identify with. But as a Christian, what God's Spirit is supposed to do in us is help us to love that which we don't like. And to be effective as a Christian witness, then more and more, God will ask us to love that which we don't like. And I've made a whole career out of acting like I like stuff because I love someone. (laughs) Now, that's unless they go to Disney World. I don't make any bones about I don't like Disney World. But probably I should. I should act like I like Mickey Mouse for those who like Mickey Mouse. I refuse to wear the ears, though. Now, all that said, God desires that we set down and plant roots, if you will, even in places that we abhor. I remember uh, years ago, and now it's been 18, 19 years ago, when I was still on staff at Maranatha Chapel in San Diego, that we had sent out a guy to Wheaton, Illinois, to plant a church, just like I would do a few years later. And he had been the high school pastor at Maranatha Chapel. I was the junior high pastor. And he had went to Wheaton, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. He was a graduate of Wheaton University, lived there his whole life, except for the few years he had been in San Diego. And he went back and planted this church. And it was a year, year and a half later that he came back out to visit San Diego because he still had family that had moved from Chicago to San Diego. And he came out in uh, the wintertime. Now listen to me. If you want to hate the Midwest more than you do, go visit a warm place in the wintertime. It's going to seal the deal for you. You'll, You'll hate your very existence. So that's what he does. And he showed up on a day that we as pastors used to go out to lunch once or twice a month. And Pastor Ray would take us out. And we went to this one particular little restaurant in Poway called Felipe's. I can still see he he asked Scooter to come along with us, the guy who'd went and planned the church. And we were sitting around the table, 13 or 14 of us. And Scooter's talking about, you know, his first year and a half or so of church planning. And he's like, oh, it's awful. Because you wouldn't even believe how awful it is. Like, I've been there a year and a half. There's only like 60 or 70 people coming. Of, and, you know, and then oh, I, it was snowing the other day. And I was on my Pottery Barn couch looking out my window in my upper middle class neighborhood. And I just, ugh, it was so gray. I just wanted to just quit. So I still remember he's just, well, you know, he's just on and on. And Pastor Ray used to do this thing where kind of when he, you'd think he was checked out, he'd kind of put his tongue right here in his cheek. And I, uh, Ray's checked completely out of this deal. And then when Scooter gets done, Ray stops and he puts down his fork. He looks at Scooter and he says, Scooter, I think you ought to buy yourself a Chicago Bears hat and get you a, a Cubs jersey. Uh, he said, you don't have to like it there but you at least need to fake it these people love the cubs they don't want to hear you talk about the san diego chargers or the san diego padres they uh, if you want to talk about surfing go learn to surf on lake michigan you know figure it out they do it there stop talking about someplace else love what the people love and uh, then you'll be useful there even if you don't like it because you feel like god's called you there And so I've always tried to remember that you can love a place and not like it. Now, all that said, if you love it, you'll probably eventually begin to like it. God does that. And that's a part of the sanctification. Jesus says in John 17, I don't ask that you jerk these people out of the world. This is the salt and light of the world. But as they're in the world, Lord, sanctify them by your truth. And what's interesting is when God allows us to be in places that we don't like, we have a real opportunity for sanctification. Like that pressure and that tension can lead to sanctification because we seek, as it were, God's uh, truth. Now, Babylon in Scripture is always a type. It is a physical place. 
but it's also a type of the world's authority, the world's system, the world's values, the world's religion. You know, each age has its own spirit. Sometimes I, when my boys were little and they just started school, they would come home and they would be talking about stuff and, and I would be like, where did my boys get this? And I realized it wasn't anything they was taught or that they were taught. It was just the spirit of the age. It, it reminded me that the spirit of my boy's age is different than the spirit of the age I was raised in 30 years ago. I, I was like, wow, there's a, there's a spirit of the age and, and Babylon represents that. Now, the rub for us as, us as Christians, no matter what age you live in, is that we are actually, as Jesus said, not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. And, you know, you get this when you read Paul. He writes to Colossae. I write to the Christians in Colossians uh, who are in Colossae, yet they're saints, which means our residence is actually of or in heaven. So we have this, uh, this juxtaposition within us that the unsaved person never has. They, this is their home. This is their world. This is what they're living for. It's why when you go to a funeral, people are so destroyed when this is all they have because they've lost everything. But for the Christian, we can sorrow as one who has hope because this is not our home. And the more I live in this world, you know, I feel like I'm just passing through. And the longer I walk with Christ, I, I feel like I want to make this a better place. I do. You know, I want to take care of the planet. Uh, and I want to make sure that if the Lord tarries, I leave something that my family or my community uh, can actually take the baton and run forward with. I, I want that. I care about the good of those around me. But that said, this is not my home. And I want to live more and more like Abraham, who I have from Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, what it said about Abraham, that by faith, he dwelt in uh, the land of promise, that's Israel, as in a foreign country. God said, here's where all your people are going to be, but you're going to dwell in it by faith as if you were in a foreign country. So he went and lived there, and he purposefully dwelt in tents. Now, you might say, well, he was just a Bedouin. He was a nomad. No, he could have built a home. He could have, like many people today, I'm going to build my forever home right here, you know, on Mount Zion, overlooking the Kidron Valley, and man, it would have been awesome, but he chose to dwell in tents, and he raised his kids to do the same, for he waited for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to invest everything that I have. I want to make this a better place. I want to fulfill God's plan for my life, but I want to understand that I'm just passing through. I'm, if you will, a pilgrim. Now, you know, when the uh, first, we'll call them Americans, came over on the Mayflower and such, they were what they call pilgrims. And they were called that because a pilgrim is someone who makes a spiritual journey. They're making a journey and they have a spiritual destination in mind. Now, for sure, the early pilgrims, they were leaving oppression in Europe to come here because they wanted to recreate Israel. They, they wanted the freedom to worship as they wanted. And uh, Peter Marshall's got a fantastic book on this called The Light and the Glory. There's actually two volumes. But all that said, um, they were looking for that. So they were on a spiritual journey. In that sense, and in keeping with John Bunyan's famous book, Pilgrim's Progress, we are all on a pilgrimage as Christians uh, towards heaven. This is just a, a place where we make stops in a journey towards our final destination. Which, by the way, I should mention this to you. What kind of music did uh, the pilgrims listen to? You probably didn't know this. Plymouth Rock. That's a pretty good one. Now, all that said, um, God's saying here, look, what I want you to understand is uh, you can actually submit to this and make this place that you don't want to be in a place uh, that's better by your presence. And do you know that sometimes as Christian, God puts us in places that we don't like because he wants to make that place 
better because of our presence. Now, all that said, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. I just want to mention this. This is so neat to me because this prophecy was one of the prophecies from Jeremiah that Daniel was reading in Daniel 9 when he realized that his captivity was about up. So here you have Daniel taken from Jerusalem at a very young age. He's been 60 some years and now how cool is it? We have the words of the Lord 3,000 years later or so, you know, and then we have Jeremiah writing and Daniel has them just a few decades later. And he's like, oh man, look at this. There's hope for me. I know this thing is about up. And so as he is reading this, that the 70 years are completed, then when they are, uh, the captives will understand this. Verse 11, for I know, God says, the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11. Um, Bible Gateway said in 2018 that this verse surpassed John 3.16 as America's favorite Bible verse. This is the one that most people call their life verse. Now, most people don't know that, and if you have this as your life verse, please put on your thick skin for a second. You probably also have as your favorite band, Twisted Scripture. Because most people don't actually live by this verse as it is in context. So when you think about uh, this particular verse and you read, you know, through Jeremiah like we've been reading, one website put it like this. They said, uh, this verse is written on graduation cards. It's quoted to encourage a person who can't seem to find God. It shouldn't be God's will, but will. Uh, and it's doled out like a doctor explaining a prescription. Hey, take Jeremiah 29, 11 a few times with a glass of water and uh, call me in the morning. I think you'll be better. <laughs> Now, uh, most commonly, uh, this as a life verse, this verse is applied to a personal promise. So people, you know, will, will say, hey, God has a wonderful and a perfect plan for me, you know, to give me a future and a hope. And many take this verse, you know, applying it specifically to them, uh, that God has perfectly mapped out their life and all they have to do is be obedient to uh, to grasp that, to step into that, which is partly true. Now, that said, um, you think about this verse, and the main problem with these interpretations is that they are very uh, me-centric. They're very me-focused. Um, now, while God does write the Bible for individuals, and there's plenty of stuff that's for me, one of the issues we really have in Western Christianity the Western mind is very individualistic. Uh, the Eastern mind is not. So if you were to study the Bible with the Eastern mind in mind, the Eastern mind always values the 99 above the one or the group above the one, which was so uh, shocking to listen to Jesus say that he would leave the 99 and go find one because the Eastern mind would be like, no, you never sacrifice the group over the one. In the Western mind, especially, especially in like conservatism, uh, the more conservative you are typically, the more you would uh, value the one over the 99. My individual rights, my individual life. Anyway, that's, that's how we approach the Bible. So, so often people read this and it's not the meaning. There's nothing about the one in Jeremiah 29, 11. Not that God couldn't speak to you individually through it, but there's nothing about the one. It's, it's about the group. And so, so often people get this verse misinterpreted just like they misinterpret most of the Bible because they just take a scripture and apply it to their lives even though it's out of context. Now, um, Dr. David Jeremiah, I have him for you there on the left, says the only way the corporate body of Christ will fulfill the mission Christ has given it is for the individual Christian to have a vision for fulfilling the mission personally. So here's our rub, right? God uh, makes up the church, the body of Christ with individuals. So we each have to find our individual purpose to make up the body of Christ and fulfill God's mission. But then N.T. Wright on the other side says, far too many people 
especially within evangelicalism, think that the individual is all that matters, or I'd say at least matters more, and that uh, the corporate dimension of the church is a distraction or a diversion. And therefore, of course, Christians, uh, you know, they have this deeply personal relationship with Christ. That's for every single Christian. But as nobody should get lost in the kingdom of God, neither should you play the corporate dimension off against the individual dimension. And this is why, you know, you can find people that just don't really value assembling with the body of Christ or they can take off for any reasons. Like, I love, I love to worship Jesus in the deer woods. Well, that's great, but that's all about you. You know, that, that's all about you. And what about, do you understand that one of the reasons assembly with the body is so big is because when I show up, I bring something to the body that nobody else does. And when you show up, you bring something to the body that nobody else does. And you may feel like that nobody even ever knows you or sees you, but God says your presence in a group actually fills out the body of Christ. And so the corporate dimension is very powerful uh, for this particular reason. Now, all that said, finally, uh, here's the deal. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 14, and specifically verse 11, basically says this. (laughs) Buckle in because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Hey, if you've got this on your mirror, chapter 29, verse 11, just get up every morning and go, buckle in. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Praise Jesus, I love this verse. Further, the text prescribes, it says here, (laughs) radical measures to take in order to be a blessing to others in the midst of your judgment. Oh man, I'm living in the midst of judgment. Buckle in, it's going to get worse and I get to be a blessing. Praise the Lord, my life verse. But if it's hanging on your bathroom mirror, that's essentially what you have hanging there. Now, all that said, because I've got half the chapter left and only five minutes, I assume I will go over at least 10 minutes. So you buckle in. (laughs) Verse 12 says this, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me uh, and find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, and I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. So after the 70 years, then the future and the hope. Now, the Lord... uh, is found when he is searched for with the whole heart or with all the heart. And this is because God often hides himself and casual searching won't do it. I mean, Isaiah 45 said, God is the God who hideth himself. That's the King James Version. God only speaks the real truth in the King James Version. You know, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. It's not true. Didn't speak in the King James, but he does hide himself. And Jesus went on to hide himself in a way to the masses. And I have for you uh, from Matthew 13, what happens when his disciples start to hear him speak in parables? So with them, he's very plain. With the masses, as the crowds grow, he then switches to parables. A parable, so you understand, and most of you could quote this from me, so suffer through it, but it's para, which is with or alongside, and able, which is to cast So a parable is to cast alongside an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Does that make sense? So very simple. So he starts telling these stories, but they confuse people. The people are like, what? What's he talking about? So the disciples, they said to him, why do you speak in parables to these people? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know uh, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But to him who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because, and now he quotes Isaiah. Seeing they uh, do not see. And hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. What Jesus is saying is. Is you know why you know and understand the secrets? Because look where you are. (laughs) You're right here. I said the hard stuff and you're here trying to figure it out. The people who. Uh, aren't meant to hear, they've already closed their ears off long ago. They're like, what? That's hard. That seems too difficult. 
And so they just walk away. So you ask yourself, why would God play hard to get? Why? I thought God wanted everybody to be saved. Well, he does, but he also wants to separate the true believers from the false believers because our hearts can deceive ourselves. And so what he understands is this. If he plays a little hide and seek with us, desperation leads to revelation. I used to love to play hide and seek with my kids. I'm like Houdini. Like the one-eyed Houdini. You give me a curtain, I can get behind that sucker, suck up, stand there, they can't find, oh man. And how cool it is, the more they had to search, the more desperate they were, the more joy when they found me, right? This is the truth with the Lord. He loves us like a father to a child. So he understands sometimes we won't search. And so desperation leads to uh, revelation. Now, all that said, now he gets to the letter uh, to the false prophets that are in Babylon. Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all his people who dwell in this city, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you captive. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm going to send on these people who don't follow here locally, the famine, the pestilence, the sword, make them like rotten figs. Chapter 24, you might remember the baskets of figs that cannot be eaten, so they are, you know, they're so bad that that make you sick. And I will pursue them with sword, and famine, and pestilence. I'll deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach to all the nations where I've driven them. Because they've not heeded my word, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, neither would you heed, says the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you who are in captivity, whom I've sent to Babylon. Verse 21, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of uh, Koaliah. This is not old King Ab Ahab married to Jezebel, but a prophet later. And Zedekiah, not King Zedekiah in Jerusalem, but another false prophet, Zedekiah, living in Babylon at this time, who's the son of Messiah, uh, who prophesy a lie to you. Behold, uh, I will deliver them into the hand of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and he will slay them. And you'll see it. And because of them, a curse shall be taken up by all the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, who the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they have done disgraceful things in Israel. They've committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. They've spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Indeed, I know, and I am a witness, says the Lord." Now, by the way, this is like a little proverb that children were singing in the street. May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king Babylon roasted over the fire. Uh, yeah, we couldn't stomach that in America now, could we? That wouldn't be a big one. You know, that's, but of course, if you ever taught your kid, like you ever read um, Grimm's fairy tales, it's about the same deal. I mean, everybody's getting roasted in that deal. Hansel and Gretel. Uh, Rumpelstiltskin's my favorite. You know, a little guy, angry little guy. So, look, um, what we have going on here is, again, while Jeremiah is dealing with false prophets, specifically Hananiah in Jerusalem, there are these in Babylon peddling their lies. So Jeremiah calls them out, and he prophesies, just like we say here, and eventually people are going to sing about it, <laughs> that if you, if you lie in the name of the Lord, then eventually you're going to be like Ahab and Zedekiah, who Nebuchadnezzar roasted in the fire, just like Daniel's three friends. Now, just for a second, I know we're out of time, but humor me just for a second, because this is how my mind works when I read the Bible. Uh, so I'm going to ask for uh, forgiveness uh, before I start. But when I think about this, I think about, <laughs> why did Nebuchadnezzar love to roast people or might be like flame broil them so much? You think about despots over human history. Why, you know, why does one guy like to crucify people? One guy likes to saw people in half. One guy likes to pull off limbs. One guy likes to go William Wallace and gut people. Why do, you know, you wonder what makes a guy like pick, and Nebuchadnezzar's preferred method is like, I'm going to burn people. Burn, baby, burn. And so uh, here he is. He, he loves to, in fact, he throws, you know, Daniel's three friends in the fire, and it's so hot it kills his own guard. And he's like, well, that's just attrition. You know, I mean, you, you got to have a fire. But it makes me think, I was thinking about this, uh, Flame roll whoppers. 
Now, I, now I looked around and I, so I was like, well, look at this. So you got, uh, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, things were creepy. You know, now things are more overt. They're just overtly dark. You know, but things are very, very creepy. You know, my, uh, I was talking to my mom the other day about how veiled things were a few decades ago. Like, John F. Kennedy was the worst uh, and most promiscuous president in, like, the history of presidents. But nobody would cover it because he was the first Catholic president. Uh, he made Bill Clinton look like a choir boy. And, by the way, the next guy, uh, you know, LBJ was just as bad almost. But nobody covered it back then. You didn't do that. So now we would know about all this stuff, but, and it's just, things are just overt. It's overtly dark. You know, you got all these crazy dark shows on television, just really, really evil in that sense. But Burger King was weird. You know, look at the king. And he's inviting kids to his magical kingdom. And I didn't think it was that weird. You know, you're looking at me like, why, why are we taking, we came for this on Sunday morning, but just look at this for a second. Uh, this is the, uh, the advertisement from the Have It Your Way campaign when I was a kid. And it reads like this. If you can't see it, I'll read it for you. You have the right to have what you want exactly when you want it. Because on the menu of life, you are today's special. And tomorrow's. And the day after that. And, well, you get the drift. That's right. We may be the king, but you, my friend, are the almighty ruler. Snatched right out of the secular humanism pits of hell for Burger King. <laughs> but I did think about this. If that's the way I was raised and that stuff's in my mind, then no wonder my age group can't agree to disagree because we're all the almighty ruler. So I can't like you if you don't agree with me and I certainly can't love you if I don't like you because I am the authority therefore let's fight let's hate each other right and like King Nebuchadnezzar roasting opponents is the way of the person who sees himself or herself as the ruler if you're always roasting people you probably think you rule Nebuchadnezzar didn't know he wasn't ruling at all God was the one in charge now finally the last section verse 24 you shall also speak to Shemaiah the Nehalamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah the son of Maasiah the priest, and all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest, so that you should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man, who is demented and considers himself a prophet, that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, we find out that he's writing from Babylon back to Jerusalem, calling Jeremiah demented and calling for his imprisonment and his silence. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah, who makes himself a prophet to you? For he has sent us in Babylon, saying the captivity is long, 70 years, in fact, Build houses, dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat their fruit. He doesn't like that. This guy has been prophesying in Babylon, will be gone in two years. Now Zephaniah the priest read the letter to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, send to all those in captivity. Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehalamite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him. He goes on to say, and he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore says the Lord, behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehalamite, and his family. And he shall not have anyone to dwell among his people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. As we close, two more slides. Shemaiah the Nehalamite writes to silence Jeremiah. His name actually means dreamer. The title Nehalamite means dreamer. And God basically says, I'm going to turn your dreams into a nightmare. But what we do come back to is this problem that within the Jewish religion, there were competing factions. There were two different groups, Jeremiah, a few others scattered here or there, that are prophesying, and they say, we're the true prophets. It's going to be 70 years. Now there's a whole big group prophesying it's going to be two years. That's a problem. 
I'd like to think that I would have been on God's side, on Jeremiah's side, but I tell you what, I like two years a lot more than I like 70 years. I, I may have not bought into the true message. So again, how do we know about false prophets? And Jesus says, beware of false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. But you'll know them by your fruits, he said in Matthew. And, and I just say this, one of the ways that you can be kept safe from false prophets is the body of Christ, the local church. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, uh, you have 10,000 teachers or guardians, however you want to translate it, yet you've not got many fathers. I fathered you in Jesus Christ. So here's Paul. He spent time with these people. He endured persecution with these people. After Paul left, these guys, that w uh, they spoke better than Paul. They were more popular than Paul. They came in and they completely uh, lied to the Corinthians. And Paul says, look, I'm your father in Christ. God put me in your life to father you. These guys are slicker than me. They look better on TV than me. They may even have big congregations, but I'm your guy. And the relationship in a body of Christ between pastor and parishioner, you might say shepherd and sheep, is meant to keep the wolves at bay. That doesn't mean you have to hang out with the elders every week, but you should be in a body of Christ where you can see in a person's life growth and truth and, and the character of Christ. You should also be able to see they're not perfect. If somebody's perfect, they probably are not what they seem to be. But they shouldn't also be overtly sinful. We should get to grow together. One of the things I love the most about having pastored Parkland Chapel 17 years is I feel like I've grown up with a church. I'm growing. I'm grown. Well, I'm not completely grown, but I'm growing. You know, I have grown. And I get to see people grow. And I hope that in 10 years, if I'm still around, you'll be able to say, wow, I don't know how we ever put up with Mike Harrison 10 years ago. You know, he's grown so much. He was just a little baby in Christ. But that, but that said, the local pastor and the, and the sheep in that congregation, there's things and truths that God wants to speak. There should be a trust, right? And this is real important in a day where we have all these competing voices, especially from social media and other stuff that people get, to, you know, kind of pulled off into. And it's not that there's not great stuff on there. I appreciate technology. I, I, I have a whole library that doesn't exist anymore in my office because I can just do it with a press of a button. I'm appreciative of that. But there's a lot of stuff where people are flashy or awesome that they pull people away and there are, are, are diligent pastors that love their sheep and are praying for them and, and their hearts are breaking because their people are being pulled away by competing factions in the body of Christ. Now all that said, wolves fear fire. And that's why you always see in a, you know, if wolves are chasing somebody down in a movie, they build a big campfire and then they wave around firebrands. The wolves, boy, they'd like to get in there and eat them some people, but they can't because they hate fire, they hate smoke, they hate the light. And all of this stuff is what's created in relationship. Relationship is frictious. You know, you, you come here long enough, I'm going to say something that's stupid, probably did today. You're going to be like, man, I, I can't stand that guy. You know, what, what, Burger King? I mean, we wouldn't be 10 minutes over if you didn't talk about Burger King, you know? But, but the truth is, like, any, any relationship you have, we all have, like, our warts and our faults. We rub up against one another. It, it causes heat. It causes light. If you make it through a few uh, scrapes with someone, your relationship will actually be stronger. But the, the wolf and sheep skin will never endure the fire in the body of Christ. They'll never want part of real. They'll never want part of your life. They want a platform to share or to influence, but not to do life with people. By the way, neither will a goat, which we are sheep, we are not goats. A goat, when it doesn't like what's going on, it'll just run off, jump on somebody's car and lick the paint. You know, it's out of here. Sheep be like, you know, I don't like it, but the rest of the body's here. I think I'll stick. You know, I, 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 I'll stick especially if, and finally, uh, here's the master's voice. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep, they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And here's the thing. God is seeking those who are thirsting for his appearance. And when we seek the Lord, we will be found by him. And how do you begin to discern between true and false, even if they both sound true? Or one that's false sounds better than the one that's true. It's this, that you learn to hear the Lord's voice from him personally and then through 
the person, the under shepherd that he might be speaking through. And you do this by seeking him early, seek him midday, seek him late, whatever works for you. By the way, if people do about what they want, do you know that? Lyndall Miley, he's, he wasn't here. He drives a trash truck. He has to be at work at four. He gets up at three. Just recently, he was at a small group with me telling me that now he gets up at two so he can spend an hour with Jesus before he leaves at three to get to work at four. So I hope you feel worse about your Christianity now because Lyndall's better than you. <laughs> I'm just saying we all do what we want, right? We all can do what we want. But that said, seek the Lord. If you drive to St. Louis, listen to scripture on the way up there, pray on the way back. You won't even have to get up an hour early. You know, whatever you do, make time for him. Make time to walk and pray. If you, if you walk, go pray. The, the point is this, and I close. Desire his appearance, and he will show up, and he'll speak to you, and you'll begin to recognize his voice over competing entities. It's promise. So, Father God, in all the noise of the life that we live in, Give us the desire to, you know, to show up and to seek your face, your voice, your person. And then, Father God, please, Lord Jesus, um, help us to hear you. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that you are the God who has for us a future and a hope. And we uh, pray that you would bless us to uh, walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys uh, stand?